Well, hello everyone. We come together today to uh, complete session 18, His Ways Are Higher. Um, we're going to be looking at Job chapters 38 and 39. Um, well, as a recap from last week's session 17, we worked our way through chapters 36 and 37. We finally finished Elihu's speech. Um, now we move on to the most important speech, and that is God's speech. His is truly the only one that matters. As we move through these two chapters, 38 and 39, I'll do what I've always done, stop and pause and answer the homework questions, maybe add a few words of commentary here and there. Well, how did you feel that you did with the homework? I received a couple of your uh, responses, and I'm, I'm still being encouraged by those, so thank you for turning those in and, and getting those back to me. Uh, probably it was a, the most simple set of questions that we've had, um, but the hardest question probably was question number three because it dealt with your emotions. A lot of people have a hard time sharing their emotions. Um, I'm not one of them, uh, but maybe you are, but I, I appreciate you answering them the best that you could. Um, the questions were, um, of course, reread chapters 38 and 39. And then the, uh, the question for, from, for, chap, for chapter 38, define the term theophany and provide the verse or verses where you see theophany used. Again, that's my dog's barking. That's just the way it is here at the house. Um, so for chapter 38, define the term theophany, provide the verse or verses where you saw a theophany being used. And then the qu last question, question number three, if you're keeping them in number, what were your overall emotions as, as you read through these two chapters, your feelings as you read through them. Well, as we move um, into God's speech, we begin to see more clearly what we are to be learning from the book of Job. I mean, there's a lot of application that we can make from the book of Job, but Job contextually uh, is interpreted one way. What is the overall purpose of the book of Job? As we get closer to the end of the book, chapters 40, 41, and 42, it becomes more clear as far as the purpose of the book of Job. So as we get closer, we're learning more about the exact purpose within the context. Many applications can be made, but there's only one uh, interpretation because it's contextual. Um, in God's speech, you, you would have noticed that God, He didn't hold back. He just told everything like it was, exactly what Job, the three friends, and Elihu needed to hear. And it's exactly what you and I need to hear. The book of Job is highly applicable to our lives. Well, we're going to get right on into chapter 38 and 39, but before we do, let's have a, a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for the beautiful day today. Lord, there's a, a crisp breeze blowing, and it's such a wonderful relief from the rain. We just pray that that as we move into summer, that the heat will not be so unbearable, the humidity. But Lord, we just now pray that you open our eyes and our hearts to receive your word. Teach us what you'd have us to know. Show us what you'd have us to learn. Show us what you would have us to emulate in, in our Christian lives. We thank you for your word. You've, what a precious gift it is to us. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, as you've quickly realized... As you read 38 and 39, more or less, God's speech is in the form of questions. He really questions Job. There's a lot of questions. Next week, I'll give a recap of how many questions there were. But he asked Job many, many questions. And of course, we know that this is in the hearing of the three friends and Elihu. So when God spoke, everyone present, everyone involved was able to hear that. Um, God, by speaking to Job and the others the way that he did, uh, was drawing their attention very pointedly to the fact that he is God and they were not. The same goes for us. He is God. You and I, we are not God. He is. He is holy. He is perfect. We are not. We are working toward holiness being more and more complete in the character and actions 
verbiage, facial expressions of Jesus Christ. But we are not yet made perfect until Christ returns and, and it's all said and done and we will be fully glorified with Christ. So we're still imperfect. We're still being made into complete holiness one day on to full glorification. Right out of the gate, we answer homework question number one. Define the term theophany and give examples from the text. There was only one example. Verse 1. The, verse 1 contains um, the theophany. Look at verse 1 in chapter 38. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of a storm. He said, the word theophany is a combination of two Greek words, theo, capital T, theo, meaning God, and phany, P-H-A-N-Y, meaning appearance. God appearance. A theophany is an appearance of God, a visible display of God to human beings that expresses His presence and character. It is an appearance of God a visible display of God to human beings that expresses His presence and His character. We see that here expressed, God's character expressed through a storm, out of the storm. Now this storm, as we've studied it, could have been a hurricane type storm, uh, a tsunami type storm where the wind was just blowing. Uh, not water as a tsunami was or is, but the, the, the mass uh, chaos of, of, of air, of the wind blowing. So it could be violent like a hurricane or the wind produced by tsunami, or it could just be a very, very strong wind. Either way, the storm is how God chose to display his character, to display his power, his presence to Job. Now, God honored Job in this way. If you will recall, God honored Moses, Elijah, Abraham, Jacob. They, God appeared to them in the form of theophanies, ways that expressed his character and his, you know, his presence. So we see God being expressed here through a storm. Now, this is very important. Because it proved to Job, it proved to the friends that God was still present. God was still in full uh, knowledge. He was, was fully acknowledging Job. So this was an honor for Job, to God, for God to express his presence and character through the storm, just like it was for Moses, Elijah, Abraham, and Jacob. Um, even though the message that God had for Job and the three friends, the message that he has for us, it, it wasn't a very pleasant um, response, uh, a very pleasant speech. But right, God got right to the point, I'm God, you are not. Who are you to question me? That's what God is saying. As we continue, we jump right in with God, his questions, which you know, they're pretty self-explanatory, so there's not going to be a lot of commentary or a lot of added information here. Just, just a few uh, comments that I'll have. Verses 1 through 3, let's look at that. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself, Job, like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Now, from these verses on... I subdivided the text. Now, I subdivide a lot so that I can better understand the flow of thinking. You may subdivide. You may not subdivide. It may not help you at all. You do what you do. You do what's good for you. I do what's good for me. So I'm going to share some of my subdivisions, but at a point I'm going to cut it off because it's so many subdivisions that I don't want to obscure the learning that we need to get out of this text. But the first section... Verses 4 through 7, I labeled the earth's foundations. Let's look at verses 4 through 7. When, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand, Job. Who marked off its dimensions? 
Surely you know Job. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. That's the first section. Now the second section, verses 8 through 11, I labeled the sea's limits. Verses 8 through 11. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed its limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Where were you, Job? Did you do that, God say? We know Job didn't. Third section, verses 12 through 13, I labeled it morning's dawn, 12 through 13. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? That's very interesting there, shake the wicked out of it. Here comes the morning, here comes the dawn. Evil likes to hide in the dark, but when light appears, it pulls back, it flees. That's why Christ said, I am the light of the world. Evil has to flee. Next section, uh, fourth section, verses 14 and 15. I labeled the earth's garments, 14 and 15. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Next, we have very small section. Fifth section, verse 16, I labeled it the sea, verse 16. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Sixth section, verse 17, I labeled death. Have the gates of death been shown to you, Job? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Seventh section, verse 18, I labeled expanses. Verse 18, have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this, Job. Tell me if you understand. God is putting Job in his place and the friends and us. Proper perspective. Um, The eighth section, verses 19 through 21, I labeled light and dark. Remember? Hebrew poetry, even some of our poetry today, compares and contrasts. He's using light against the dark. Verses 19 through 21. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Do you know? Surely you know. For you were already born. You have lived so many years. God is sarcastic, isn't he? He's just throwing it right back to Job. Ninth section. Verses 22 and 23, I labeled snow and hail, 22 and 23. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? Tenth section, verse 24, I labeled lightning and east winds, verse 24. What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Job, do you know? 11th section, verses 25 through 30, rain and thunderstorm, 25 through 30. Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate, desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? Again, God is sarcastic to to a certain degree in this. And he's okay to do that because he's God. Let me see, did I read too many? I think I did. Yeah, I did. So, So the 11th section, verses 25 through 30, should have ended at 30. Um, now, I think that that's enough for me to, to subdivide how I, how I subdivided. You can do it yourself if you choose to or if you don't choose to. Um, so I'm not going to subdivide anymore. 
Well, but next God spoke about some specific constellations of stars. That's what he's talking about in these next verses, 31 through 35, the constellation of stars. And he included some more information about the earth. Verses 31 through 35. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Star constellation. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cub? Again, constellations. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who gives? Oh, well, that's enough. This, this next part. God reminded Job. God was reminding Job and the three friends about his power in creation. This is the rest of chapter 38, verses 36 through 41. 36 through 41. And then all of chapter 39. God's reminding Job and the three friends about his awesome power in creation. So we're in 38, verses 36 through 41 in the entire chapter of 39. Uh, he begins with creation, the ibis. It's a long-billed bird, a uh, rooster. So let's look at that, starting in verse 36 and going through 39, chapter 39. Who gives the ibis wisdom, a long-billed bird wisdom, or gives the rooster understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness? Do you? And satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Do you do that for them, Job? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Chapter 39. Do you know when the morning goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. Who let the wild donkeys go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it, I gave it the wasteland as its home, the salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion in the town. It does not bear a driver's shout, hear a driver's shout. It ranges the hills for its pasture and searches for any green thing. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will it, stay by your, will it stay by your manger at night? Can you hold it to the furrow with a harness? Will it till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on it for its great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to it? Can you trust it to haul your grain and to... to your grain and bring it to your threshing floor. The wings of the ostrich, he's talking still about his creation. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings and feathers of the stock of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. Or 16. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Do you give the horse its strength? Still talking about his creation, power of creation. <clears throat> Do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with the flowing mane? Do you make it leap like a locust, stirring ter striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength, and, char and charges into fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side. The horse, the quiver rattles against its side, along with the flashing spear and lance. In frenzied excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand till it cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts. Ah! It catches the scent of battle from afar, the shout of commanders and the battle cry. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Job does it. 
Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its stronghold. From there it looks for food, its eyes detect it from afar. Its young ones feast on blood, and where the slain are, there it is. It's almost like he's talking about a buzzard. So we see God putting Job, the three friends, you and I, in our proper place proper perspective. He is God. You and I are not God. Who are we to question His perfect justice? He is just. Even the things we consider bad, He's in control of. He's allowing it. He's sometimes causing it. Yes, we see that from Job. But He's still God. He's still God. Well, this is where I address the last question for everybody. That's a bright light, isn't it, when I shine it? Anyway, that's what I want to do. The last question probably was the most difficult question from our homework because it was an emotional question. But anyway, what were your overall emotions as you read through chapters 38 and 39? Did it become overwhelming to you? All the many questions? Um, Was that overwhelming or was the awesomeness of God that overwhelmed you. What were your emotional responses to God when you read through these questions that he was asking Job and in the hearing of the three friends? Did it cause you to think about perspective, that he's God and we're not? We're not perfect, he is. How, how did you feel? There's a plethora of emotions that could come welling up in you as you read these through chapters. It's just like, God, you are God. I am nothing, and we know from the Word that we're nothing apart from Jesus Christ. It's just amazing the emotions, if we allow them, the emotions that can come up in us as we read the Word of God. That's the Holy Spirit stirring things up, moving things around in our hearts and our minds. It's exciting. The the Word of God is alive. It's living. It's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts even through the marrow and bones of those reading it. It's powerful. Why don't we read it every day? Why don't we read it as we would a novel of any kind, a fictional, oh, this is good stuff. What emotions did you feel? Well, here, are my, here is my response. My emotional response, and I tie it right back to Scripture, Psalm 150. This is my emotional response to chapters 38 and 39. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His support. surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath do what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That should be our emotional response. When we read chapters like Job 38 and 39, oh, I hope that it stirred in your heart as you read it. If it didn't, you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself. If chapters 38 and 39 and then reading of Psalm 150 doesn't stir something up inside of you, an act of worship, an act of charity, an act, an act of encouragement, uh, uh, being the hand, if that doesn't encourage you and challenge you, Check yourself. Check yourself. All right, next week, moving on. Chapters 40 and 41, and then we have only one chapter left. So next week, reread or read for the first time chapters 40 and 41, and hear your questions. Now, there are two questions, but each question has three parts. Number one, from chapter 40, Then the three-part question. A. What was 
a behemoth. God talks about behemoth in chapter 40. Well, what was a behemoth? Share your research. B, the second part of question one. Was God using the example of the behemoth as a metaphor? If so, what or whom did the behemoth represent? Third section, C of question one. What was God's motive for speaking about a behemoth? What was God's motive for speaking about behemoth? That's a tough one. I'm moving this around so the light's kind of funky. Let me read number one again. From chapter 40, a three-part question. A, what was a behemoth? Share your research. B, was God using the example of behemoth as a metaphor? If so, what or whom did the behemoth represent? C, the third part of one. What was God's motive for speaking about behemoth? And then here's question two. Again, it's a three-parter from chapter 41. Three-part question. A, what was a Leviathan? Share your research. Where did you get your information from as you studied what is a Leviathan? Just because it's on Google, don't mean it's proper. Don't mean that it is appropriate. Don't mean that it is correct. Chapter 41, three-part question. A, what was a Leviathan? Share your research where you got it from. B, second part of, of, of number two, was God using the example of Leviathan as a metaphor? If so, what or whom did the Leviathan represent? And see the third part of question two, what was God's motive for speaking about a Leviathan? Now these questions could send you over the edge. <laughs> I know that it could, but maybe it won't. Oh, my light went away. I'll turn those into Joanna. She'll be able to email those out to you if you missed the questions. Well, my, for some reason my recording is trying to cut out on me, so I've got to go, uh, but um, I love you. Uh, continue to pray over the prayer guide and, and, and do all that, that, that uh, we need to do to get the next set of, of chapters under our belt and move on from there. Be praying about where we're going from here. I don't know where we're going after Job. Probably somewhere in the New Testament. So be praying that God will lead me to our next Wednesday night study and pray that more people get involved with this. Okay, pray, pray, for, pray for me and pray for that, that more people get involved. I will also pray for all the graduates graduating today, Wednesday, and, and some, some other days in this week. Well, I love y'all. Y'all have a good rest of your Wednesday evening. Let me pray us out. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your word that it is true from cover to cover. We just thank you, Father, for just speaking to our hearts the way that you do. Lord, those on our prayer guide, we lift up to you. Pray that your will be done in our lives. For Lord, help us on these next few chapters. Really focus, really dig in, really dig deep to, to know what your purpose is from this book, wonderful book of Job. Thank you for blessing us with it. We love you. We praise you. We exalt you. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, church, you see it's dark now. I've waited too long to do the recording, but it is what it is. I love y'all. Y'all have a great day.